Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have Coach Alex on the show today. He is an amazing individual. Originally, he was an engineer, and he transferred over to the health industry. He is a life coach and a wellness coach, and he has some amazing things that he does to help his clients improve their overall life. And today he's going to go over some things about, you know, being practical and you know what he's going to go in depth, what he means by, be, you know, turn your life and turn, making it more practical and how it actually can affect your overall health and well-being mentally and physically. So Alex, it's wonderful to have you on the show today. Tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Hi, Stacey. Good to see you. Um, first, I want to give you some props. I, I've listened to a, a pretty decent amount of your podcast now. Um, I love the variety. Uh, I know some businesses, it's important to just get into a niche and stay in that niche. Um, I think you have great variety. Like I can scroll through your podcast and there's inevitably something that I go, okay, this is cool. I want to listen to this. So just want to give you some props. Thank you. Um, and yeah, about me, my name is Alex Christov. I'm a wellness coach. Uh, I suppose technically I'm a life coach. I call myself a wellness coach. I'll, I'll get into why later. Um, as you mentioned, I'm classically an engineer. I have two bachelor's degrees, both in engineering. I spent the majority of my professional career as a software engineer. Um, I got into coaching because... In starting in about 2007, I started having some health difficulties and went to doctors and specialists for about a decade as things got worse and worse and worse. Um, I, I couldn't get a diagnosis. I had several wrong diagnoses. I had people telling me that it's in my head. I'm a hypochondriac, yada, yada, yada. So by 2017, things got so difficult that I could no longer work. Um, I lost virtually everything. Um, my marriage ended due to this. Um, it, it got so bad that I had difficulties going to the store to buy myself food. I ended up in my parents' house in a room, mostly in a bed for five years. Um, pretty horrific experience, but I won't go into it because this isn't really about me. I'm, I'm not here today to talk about me. Um, but the point of telling you that is that during what I call the dark years, I spent a lot of time in online support groups. Um, it was my first experience with being surrounded with people by people who are struggling. Um, you know, I just, it was something very new to me and, and it was, it affected me deeply because it's something that, that obviously I was going through in an incredibly different circumstance. And honestly, it made me very, very sad that, that so many people are unhappy and struggling. Um, so I, I eventually made the decision that if I dig myself out of this hole, I want to help people. I did eventually dig myself out. I diagnosed myself. I came up with my own program to, to rehabilitate myself. Um, and I started a coaching business. And it's, it's I can't put into words how wonderful it is. Um, you know, I help people smile every day. That's basically my job. Like it, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah. Um, you know, well, once upon a time, I thought engineering was awesome and it was, and it is, but this is a completely different world. Um, so I wanted to talk about something I see very often, which is, I think we overcomplicate things. And I think there are practical solutions to basically everything, which I don't believe a lot of the coaching community addresses. It's, it can be very 
ethereal concepts, very kind of just nebulous things, you, you know, stuff that you, you hear and it makes you feel good, but it doesn't really give you anything to go on. Right. Um, again, I'm classically an engineer. So for me, it's all about practicality, right? Um, in engineering, if I'm building a bridge, I don't get to come up with a nice story and make a bridge based off a nice story, right? I have to know that it's not going to collapse. Right. It's going to bear the weight. It's going to be okay with the elements, with the weather, you know, extreme temperature changes, whatever it is, like this thing cannot collapse. Right. Um, so that, that's how I approach everything. And in that vein, I want to give people some, some practical tools to, to start to better themselves, if that's what they're looking for. Um, it's a long journey, but it starts with motivation, all right? And I'll tell you right now, I'm not a motivational speaker. Um, <laughs> if I'm working with you, I will, I will cheerlead you on, right, <laughs> throughout the program. Um, I offer a 10 week program, so it, it's not a one-time thing and I will cheerlead you on, but motivation has to come from within. Yes. Right. No matter how many awesome things I tell you, Stacy, tomorrow you're going to be the best sea captain ever. Mm -hmm. Well, if Stacy has no interest in being a sea captain and, you know, knows nothing about the sea doesn't want to learn about, you know, waves and blah, blah, blah. She's not going to be the best sea captain, no matter how much I tell her she will be. Right. Right. So I cannot motivate you to be a, the best sea captain ever. It's, it's not going to happen. So motivation is something internal. So then the question is, when you lack motivation, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. Well, the easy answer is actually the only answer, which is motivation is either a need or a want, mm -hmm. right? And so when I talk with clients, first of all, th so that there are several reasons why we may lack motivation, um, or at least it seems that way. There's only one reason we actually lack motivation. There are three reasons why we may be motivated, mm -hmm. but not do anything. Right. The main reason we lack motivation is, and I, I get this from clients all the time, you know, I asked them, well, give me an example of a time in your life when you were motivated. And one of the most common answers is, well, when I'm at a breaking point. Right. And so then I asked them, okay, you've hired a coach. So something is not right. Mm -hmm. Right. Whether you're struggling to pay the bills, right. You're living paycheck to paycheck. Right. Or your relationships are crap, mm -hmm. right? You don't have healthy relationships or your job is constantly stressing you out. You, you have no time to yourself. You have no free time, right? You, you don't have good work, like work life balance. Right. Or, you know, you're running a business where you're barely keeping up with bills. You're barely able to pay your employees so that there are various reasons, right? Yeah. for stress, for unhappiness. And so then I asked this person, well, if, if this is the reality you're living in, aren't you living in that breaking point that you've been waiting for? Right. Right. And the, the problem is, as you and I spoke before the show, that in general, that breaking point comes very slowly. It's little tiny bits at a time. Mm -hmm. Every day, little tiny bits through months and years and years. And because it happens so slowly, because it's not something sudden and jarring, we don't actually notice it happening. Right. Right. We, we normalize it. Well, this is just how life is. Yeah. So we're, you know, we're gaslighting ourselves into thinking that, well, this is normal and this is my reality and this mm -hmm. is all I can expect. And, and this is all I can hope for. Right. But again, the truth is, 
if, if you're constantly unhappy or stressed about something, that's not okay. Right. Um, and so when, when you, when you put things in that perspective, all of a sudden people go, you know what? I mean, you're right. Why, why should I live like this? Yeah. Right. Why shouldn't I be able to grab the family and take them to Disneyland? Other people are doing it. Right. Why shouldn't I be able to do it? Right. You know, why shouldn't I not work 13, 14 hours a day? Mm -hmm. There are people who work eight hours a day and they come home and they have free time. They enjoy time with family, time with friends, whatever. Why shouldn't I have that? Right. Why should I live paycheck to paycheck? Why can't I have, you know, why can't I buy my first home? Why can't I have a retirement account? Mm -hmm. So perspective is very important. And, yeah. and, you know, which is actually very much like the health issue I had. It happened so slowly over such a long time. I never figured out what happened until things became dire. And finally, yeah. I started making sense of it because it was so slow. Um, ultimately, just so things make sense, it, it was an issue with my neck. Right? If I'd had a car accident, everything was fine before. And now all of a sudden, things are not. It's very easy, right? I can point and say, well, I had a car accident. My neck snapped. Boom. There's the issue. Yeah. Uh, in my case, it wasn't like that. It was... Basically, my muscles over years and years and years and years in front of the computer became so tight that they're putting pressure on blood vessels and on nerves. Right. That could be really detrimental. But that, absolutely. But that's the thing. It happened so slowly that I never noticed it. Right. Little by little, th this situation that, that I was in was just my normal life. Right. So perspective is critical. And, yeah. and the bottom line is if you're not happy about something, if you're constantly stressed about something, get motivated to change it. Why, why do you want to live this way? Right. That's miserable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's counter to what I think we all want. Right. We want right. to be happy. We want to be content, at least to yeah. some degree. Mm -hmm. We want to be at peace. Yeah. Uh, Otherwise, why, why, why even exist, you know? Exactly, exactly. Um, so that's my version of a motivational speech. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once you get over that, then there are generally three things that, again, on the surface, they, it, it seems like they're not motivation, but, but they're different. It's... You have motivation, but you don't know what to do with it. Right. And so eventually you lose it, mm -hmm. right? So there is lack of direction. Yeah. There's fear and there is the size of the task. Mm -hmm. um, direction, obviously, that's something very personal and very different for everyone. Um, I prefer to take an approach that I think works for everybody. Mm -hmm. it, it's a bit dark, but it's effective. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm a practical person. I, I'm concerned with being effective, mm -hmm. right? So I start with the end. The end being your deathbed, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you're 100 years old, old, you've made it. You're a centenarian, congratulations, awesome. Mm -hmm. But you are 100 years old. Inevitably, mm -hmm. your time will come and you're on your deathbed. On your deathbed, when you look back on life, what do you want to see? Right. Right. Well, what is it that's going to give you joy, satisfaction, the feeling of, hey, you know what? I've lived a good life. Right. I've done good things. What does that look like? Mm-hmm. Right, because we, we can say, well, what's going to make me happy this weekend? Well, what's going to make me happy this weekend is probably hanging out with friends, having a few drinks, whatever. Right, but but that's that's not long term happiness, right? right? That that's a nice weekend with friends, but that's not a life. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so again, be practical. When I look back on my life, what do I want to see? Right. And when we start going in that direction, for some people, it's immediate. Well, I, I want to, I want to, I want to have done this, this, and this. I want to have affected things this way and that way and that way. I want the loved ones in my life to, you know, to have had good opportunities and experiences and blah, blah. There are various things. And, and for some people, it's immediate. For some people, it takes a little thought, mm-hmm. right? Well, what do I want to see in life? Right. Um, it's, it can be a big question because ultimately it's an existential, existential question, right? What am I? Who am I? What the hell am I doing here? Yeah. Um, to which I have an easy answer as well. <laughs> what makes you happy? Yes. Right. When, when I was deciding after the dark years, when I was deciding on what to do with my future. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I want to help people. And I thought about, well, how do I go about doing that? I started thinking about, well, what makes me happy? Right. And I'm an extrovert. Looking back on life, my happiest times are with people. Yes. So, you know, if, if I make an app that's going to help people be better with their finances, yes, I'm helping people, but I'm not actually working with people. Right. Right. Again, I'm an extrovert. I, I, I like talking to people. I like, you know, the, the conversations. I, I like all that. So, okay, it's going to be something where I'm directly working with people. Right. That's what makes me happy. And then the third part is obviously, what are you good at? Mm-hmm. In my case, again, I look back on life. I had an experience in college where I was a tutor for a while. Right. Um, the way that worked is that the university paid me and the tutoring was actually free for the students. Oh, okay. And what happened was eventually, you know, like most college students, I was broke. I was like, ah, I need more money. I'm going to go deliver pizza. <laughs> so, you know, the, the university is not paying enough. Got to deliver pizza. Mm. Uh, and the interesting thing is that the students I had, started calling me up saying, hey, why did you stop doing this? Can I pay you to tutor me privately? Oh, wow. So at the time, I didn't think much of it. It was just kind of like, oh, well, that's cool, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who knew? But as the years went, went by and I look back on that, it was like, okay, uh, obviously I'm good with people. I'm, I'm good with explaining concepts. I'm good at teaching them. Yes. The, the second experience that was kind of in that direction is professionally, as I rose through the ranks, got into a leadership position, I found that actually managing and coaching people was my favorite part of the job, more so than the actual engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was pretty good at it. Uh, I still keep in touch with a lot of my former direct reports. Um, you know, so looking back at those things, it was like, okay, I want to help people that that's my thing in life. That's what I want to see on my deathbed. Yeah. I want to make people happy. What makes me happy? Make it, being with people directly makes me happy. Right. What am I good at? I'm good at this. And so putting all those things together, it was like, you know what? I'm going to go into coaching. Um, and again, for some people, that's that's an instant thing. Yeah. Like, oh, I, I totally know what it is. I know my direction. Um, for others, it takes time. For me, it took time. It took a lot of time. Um, so yeah, lack of direction. Uh, the next is fear. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch things around. The the next is actually the size of the task. Right. Yeah. So when we take this long view of what do I want to see when I look back on my life, it's like, wow, oh, I want to see this and that. But, you know, let's say you, you want to look back and see a successful business. Yeah. I want to start a business. Well, it's a pretty hefty task. Yeah. Right. 
I mean, you're running a business. Did, did you get everything done in a week? I doubt exactly. it. Right? There, there are so many things you have to do. And even when you're quote unquote up and running, now you have to figure out, well, how do I market myself? How do I get my name out there? Mm -hmm. Right? So the, there are a lot of things that go into it. And, and when people look at a task and, and they see the size of it, they're like, well, I don't have the time, right? I don't have the energy. When am I going to get this done? It's never going to happen. Okay, I'm just going to stick with my crappy job. Mm -hmm. Right? And so again, th this is where it's important to be practical. And so we... <sighs> We, we're obviously very influenced by media, regardless mm -hmm. of the kind of media it is, right? Right. In general, when we see a successful business, the part that we see, the part that we know is this person has become successful and they're really good at this and that and they're a mover and a shaker in their world and you know they're buying nice cars and going on vacations and everything's awesome and blah, blah, blah. Right. The reality is that there are a few people who make it huge right off the bat. Right. But they're so, that, that number is so small. It's like winning the lottery, right? Exactly. If you're expecting that, go win the lottery. You have the same chances. <laughs> the, the vast majority of successful businesses, if you talk to the owners, they'll tell you, well, you know, it only took me 20 years to become an overnight sensation. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the reality. So the way you approach a big task is literally one foot in front of the other. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll use the business example again. Obviously, if you want to start a business, you have some idea in your head, even if it's very nebulous, not, not well thought out right now, that's okay. You, you have a general direction, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's say I want to start a business where I make windows. Mm -hmm. Well, while I'm sitting in front of the TV for the next two weeks, I'm just going to think about business names, stuff that has to do with Windows, right? Inevitably, something pops into your head. Okay, go buy the domain name. It's not much work, right? Right. The next week, this doesn't take a week, but take a week. It's okay. It literally takes about half an hour. Get online, go get a business license. Mm hmm After that, start thinking about what, what, what does your product actually look like? How are my windows going to be better than anybody else's? Right. You know what? You may have to do two years of research mm -hmm. and development. That's mm -hmm. cool. Nothing wrong with that. You know, then you worry about, well, what about a storefront? Obviously, you're going to need a website. Figure out how to do the website, blah, blah, blah. If you need a physical storefront, then you have to start looking into that. The point is, it may take you five years to get up and running. Right. But guess what? You can go with, hey, in five years, this big task is actually going to be complete or it's never going to be complete. Right. Right. And if you're interesting if you're interested in doing what you want to do if you're interested interested in bettering your circumstances in life mm -hmm. it takes time it yeah. takes work right mm -hmm. but the nice thing is you don't have to do it all at once right so again you and i talked a little bit before recording you know I call myself a wellness coach. I'm a life coach, but I call myself a wellness coach because when I work with a client, so I do a 10 week program. And when I work with clients, they have to do physical exercise. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple reasons for it. But one of the most important is that it teaches you that that whole mechanism of one step at a time 
And after mm-hmm. a while, you, you start seeing benefits, right? So I start everybody off with a 20 minute walk a day. That's it. I, I don't want you going to the gym for five hours. I don't want you to do you know, any crazy stuff. Go for a 20 minute walk. Right. right. After two weeks, we'll make it a 25 minute walk. After four weeks, we'll make it a 30 minute walk. And then mm-hmm. we'll leave it at a 30 minute walk. And, you know, the, depending on your physical limitations, because some people obviously have them, um, depending on what you may want to work on, we can start adding actual, you know, strengthening exercises. But the important thing is that this roughly happens after a month. Um, you know, exercise, physical exercise creates a lot of really good chemicals. Yes. Dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, a bunch of stuff that make you feel good. The key is, like everything in life, that level has to be built up, right? And, and it's built up little by little by little. And generally, about a month into the program, I'll get on a call with a client. And usually my first question is, how are things going? How are you? And all of a sudden they go, well, I feel pretty good. So I ask, okay, what happened? And they go, well, nothing really. I don't know why I feel good. And I say, mm-hmm. well, I know why, why you feel good. Because you've walked every day for the past month. Yeah. Right? All those good brain juices are now starting to fire. And you feel good. Mm-hmm. So it's not only about feeling good. It's seeing that if you invest a little bit regularly, it will pay off. Right. Right. We, We don't make huge changes. We don't go from one day to the next being a different person. Right. First of all, becoming somebody different overnight is extremely destabilizing. Yes. Right. Who am I? What the hell am I doing? That th- this is not me. Who have right. I become? I don't know myself. Right. Very destabilized. Second yes. of all, making huge changes overnight is destabilizing in, in terms of your day to day life. Right. Right. If somebody wants to get healthy, they want to get in shape. And this is why most people fail. Right. It's the New Year's resolution. I'm going to go to the gym for three mm-hmm. hours every day. Right. I'm going to be a badass. And they go for two weeks and then they quit. Why? Well, the obvious reason is that your body is not used to that much physical strain and you've overdone it. Yeah. So physically you're, you're worn out. You can't do it. And hopefully you haven't injured, injured yourself. But the other part, which I think most people either don't know about or overlook is that you've all of a sudden introduced this massive change to your life. Yeah. Right. You're, li- you're used to living one way. And now all of a sudden three hours of every evening are different. Mm-hmm. Right. We, we don't do well with dramatic change. Right. Right. Change is difficult for all of us. We don't like it. We like stability, right? Stability is safety. That there, there's nothing scary about stability. I know what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Right? Change is difficult for people because it takes away that sense of stability and safety. Right. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Things are different. Things are changing. Who am I? What's going on? My life is different. Everything's different. And so that's why you take those little steps. Right. Like, I'll go back to the business example. You're not all of a sudden tomorrow, oh my God, now I'm a business owner. I have three factories. I have to worry about a million things. And on top of that, who the hell am I? Until yesterday, you know, uh, I was a PCA. Now I'm, I'm a business owner of three factories. You know, what the hell is this? Right. So, you know, little steps, little steps, little steps, but doing them regularly. Right. right? Consistency is the key. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are always moments of, oh, I had this, you know, spurt of ingenuity or spurt of creativity or spurt of energy where, like, 
th this thing came to mind and, and I sat down and for three weeks, I did nothing but that. And I accomplished this amazing thing. Yes, that's ha that happens. Mm -hmm. But that's not an everyday thing. You, you can't rely on that. Right. Right. Yes, there are a few people out there who are geniuses, but 99.999% of us are not geniuses, right? right? We're just quote unquote regular people. Mm -hmm. um, so the way we do things, the way things get done is consistency, little bits every day. Right. Um, the fourth part was fear. Um, fear. So again, you know, you, you've decided, oh, th this is what I want in life. This is what I want to do, but it requires change and I don't know anything about it. So it's scary. Well, mm -hmm. in that one sentence, you've given yourself the two critical parts. It requires right. change and I don't know anything about it. Yeah. Right. So since we talked about change just a second ago, right? Well, what does change entail? Well, do it slowly, get used to it little by yeah. little, you know, dip your toe in, mm -hmm. get used to potentially being somebody different. Right. Don't change everything overnight. There's yes. no need for that. It's unrealistic. You're not going to get it, get anywhere little by little. And then the other part of fear, the obvious part is I don't know what this is. Right. You know what? Educate yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, once, once upon a time, we didn't know what smartphones were. So right. how do we get to know what they were? Well, we started playing with them. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you expose yourself to the fear. And when you expose yourself to it, two things happen. One is you learn about it. And the more you know about something, the less scary it is. Mm -hmm. The other is because you immerse yourself in it regularly, you, you become indifferent to it. Right. Right. Um, and again, this isn't an overnight thing. Right. If you're scared of flying, don't just get on a, on a transatlantic flight. Mm -hmm. Right. May, maybe go on Instagram and start following a pilot who posts videos regularly. Right. And just start watching, them, seeing what it's like in the cockpit. What is it like when the airplane is taking off? What is it like when it's landing? You know, look at videos of the cabin during um, turbulence. Mm -hmm. Right. Watch videos that are looking out the window onto the wing and how the wing flexes and all the moving surfaces when different things happen. Get used to all that, right? Right. Maybe see a, a therapist. Maybe go get, um, they, they now have, um, you know, virtual, um, what do you call it? Um, like virtual therapies, right? You put the goggles on and you're in an airplane and you're taking a flight and you have Go through all those little steps, right? You don't need to get over the fear of flying by getting on a, you know, nine hour transatlantic flight. Like that's right. crazy. You're asking for trouble. Right. Right. Little consistent steps. Mm -hmm. Learn about it. You know, how do airplanes work? What happens when there's turbulence? And it feels like the plane is just falling and falling and falling. Is it going to fall forever? Like how, you know, I mean, yeah. Airplanes experience turbulence on almost every single flight. Well, how come they're not all falling out of the sky all the time? Yeah. Right? Obviously, there's something there that keeps that from happening. Right. Read about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, practical little steps. Um, put your ego aside. That's mm -hmm. really important. That's especially for men that can be difficult. Yeah. Um, it has a time been difficult for me, for example, mm -hmm. you know, and, but all I care about is the quote unquote end product, right? What, what am I actually going after? What, what do I want to accomplish? Yeah. And 
if it's going to take this to do it, whatever this may be, I'll go and do it, right? When I started this business, I had a lot of difficulties marketing myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to go about it. Um, there are certain types of marketing that I'm not good at. Right. And I've tried, you know, I've educated myself. I've tried. They're just not my thing. And I was having a lot of difficulties figuring out how do I market myself? So, you know, you would think that somebody who's a coach would not go to another coach, but I did because I'm not a marketing coach. Right. Right. So I found a marketing coach. I work with him. The guy's awesome. Um, in case anybody cares, his name is Andrew Lampa. Um, but, you know, th this is somebody who's owned a business, mm -hmm. multiple businesses now, successful businesses. He knows what he's doing. So I went, I put my ego aside, right? I don't know everything. Right. Put the ego aside, find somebody who knows more about this than I do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I work with him and he was like, well, here's the thing, man. This is what you're good at and comfortable with. Go do this, this, and this, right? The, this is your way to marketing. Right. I was like, oh, I mean, now that you say it, yeah, it's obvious, but for some reason, it just never dawned on me. Right. Right. So thanks, I'm off to the races, mm -hmm. right? And it's, again, about being practical and, and putting your ego aside when you don't need it because it can get in the way. Ah, I know everything. How dare somebody tell me what to do, right? right? Who, who do you take me for? Like, I don't know how to live my own life and blah, blah, blah. And I don't know how to make the right decisions. And there are things we're good at and things we're not good at, right? Yeah. The things we're good at, stick to your guns. The things we're not good at, put the ego aside. Go talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. 100%. Right. Um, and yeah, exercise. I, I've mentioned exercise, sprinkled it, you know, throughout. Um, so... And, and it's funny, you know, people come to me and, and they, they come to me for all kinds of reasons. And I'm like, okay, well, if we're going to work together, one of the things you have to know is that you're going to be expected to exercise every day. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. I'm not here for exercise, right? I, I don't need to be a weightlifter or a model or whatever. Why would I exercise? <laughs> well, <laughs> because with exercise, you get some things for free some things that um, don't require spiritual journeys to the Himalayas, <laughs> which by the way, um, may or may not work <laughs> with exercise. We, we get the guaranteed things. So the things I'm talking about are, first of all, we feel good. Yeah. You know, if we go back to, 99, probably more than 99% of the time that humans have existed on earth. Mm -hmm. What have we done? We have walked. Right. Right. We domesticated horses. I don't know. Maybe 5,000 years ago. I don't know for a fact. Don't mm -hmm. quote me on this. But the reality is that unless you were a warrior or a lord, you likely couldn't afford a horse. So you walked mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's not until really the beginning of the 20th century when the car came about. And again, in the beginning, not everybody had a car. Right. So let's say it's not until the last 100 years that we started using cars or planes or trains or buses for transportation, right? Up until that point, we walked. Right. Our bodies are built to walk. That's our natural state. That's the state where all the good chemicals that the brain is capable of producing get produced. 
Mm -hmm. When we stop walking, we stop producing those things. Right. We stop producing dopamine. I mean, I don't know about you, but as far as I'm concerned, dopamine is really cool. Mm -hmm. Right? P people take drugs. People get addicted to drugs. Why? Because they make them feel good. But yeah. Right. So, so it's something we're all looking for, but mm -hmm. we have it for free. Right. And again, it doesn't take a ton. You, you don't have to run marathons. If you want to, obviously go for it. Awesome. Right. But literally, if you do a 20 to 30 minute walk every day, you're going to get mm -hmm. all those. Things, right. Oh, definitely. And when we feel good, all of a sudden it becomes a lot easier to do things that maybe we were afraid to do. Maybe right. we didn't have the energy to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Speaking of motivation, actually dopamine helps with motivation. Mm -hmm. Right. Because when, when I feel good, it's a lot easier to get off the couch. Right. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Right. When you feel good, when you're exercising, when, when you're seeing your body change, that has another effect, which is confidence mm -hmm. for two reasons. Well, for three reasons. I feel good. When we feel good, naturally, we're more confident. Number right. two, you probably look better. Mm -hmm. That's always a nice confidence boost. And number three, it's a sense of accomplishment. Right. right? Oh my God, I'm, I'm actually doing this thing. Like, how cool is this? Yeah. Obviously there's a bazillion, there are a bazillion reasons why exercise is good. You know, it reduces stress. It helps with energy levels. It, it, it helps with blood sugar levels. It reduces anxiety. It helps sleep. I mean, I can go on and on and on. Right. And the, these aren't things that somebody just made up. They're medically proven. Right. And again, why? Well, because our bodies are built to walk. Mm -hmm. They're built to do physical work. That's when they function the way they should. I'm not right. even going to say that's when they function at their best. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that's when they function the way they should. Right. Right. So exercise, <laughs> that's all I can tell you people, exercise. Take a 20 minute walk every day. It literally after a month of just that, you will notice a difference. And if you keep going, you'll notice even more of a difference. Right. And again, it's a matter of being practical. hundred percent. You know, how do I feel better? Yeah. Well, you can do it for free. Mm -hmm. And here's the beautiful thing. You don't actually have to like it. Seriously, you don't have to like it. There are a lot of days where I don't want to exercise. Right. And I do one of two things. I go, okay, you know what? It's perfectly valid. And I'm allowed to complain and moan and, and you know, use all kinds of expletives about it as long as I do it. Right. Right. If I get on the elliptical, I can mm -hmm. spend the entire time using very colorful language about how unhappy I am about doing it. Right. As long as I do it. Right. <laughs> right. That, that's the key. Just do it. You don't have to be happy. You, you really don't. Right. You know, push it. Uh, you know, and going for a walk. I don't feel like going for a walk. Along with allowing yourself to be unhappy about it. Again, baby steps. So sometimes in general, I, I love going for walks. They make me feel great. But sometimes I don't feel like it. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not superhuman. Mm -hmm. But I go, okay, I'm going to get off the couch and I'm just going to put my shoes on. That's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to put my shoes on. I don't have to go for a walk. I'm just going to put my shoes on. It's super easy to do. So I go and put my shoes on. And then I just kind of hang out by the door and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to go for a walk. All I'm going to do is walk out the door. Mm -hmm. I'll just stand outside. So I go and stand outside. And then I'm like, I'm not going to go for a walk, but I'll, I'll just walk, like, I don't know, to the next household. Just short little thing. And before I know it, 
I'm doing my 30 minute walk and I feel great. <laughs> right. You, you, in essence, have to hack yourself. Right. Right. And so it's okay to make little excuses and play little games with yourself. Right. I'm not going to go for a walk. I'm just going to put my shoes on. That is it. That's all I'm yeah. doing. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Right. You don't have to love it. <laughs> and so, yeah, consistency, little tricks, be practical about things. Um, and it starts adding up and adding up and adding up, right? And before you know it, you're a person who feels good mm -hmm. and a person who's going after what they want in life. Right. right? There, there are no guarantees, obviously. Yeah. Nothing is guaranteed. No success is guaranteed. But you can improve your odds, mm -hmm. right? Everything is a numbers game, right? If, if you play the lottery a zillion times, you'll probably win it. If you only play it once, you probably won't, <laughs> right? Yes. If, if you go on one date, what's the likelihood that that person is your forever person? Right. It's pretty low. Mm -hmm. if you go on a hundred dates with a hundred different people, mm -hmm. then there's a decent chance that you're going to meet somebody that you go, you know what, this works. We right. click, we like each other. We can build a life together. We can become each other's quote unquote person. Right. Exactly. Right. But you have to go through all those dates. Mm-hmm. Hey, you may get lucky. The first one may the first one may be it. Yeah. It's always possible because you can buy a lottery ticket once in your entire life and be a winner. It's possible. Is it likely? Absolutely not. Right. Right? So you, you have to improve your your odds. It's like there's an old joke. Um, this very frugal old man, every night he prays to God. God, please let me win the lottery. God, please let me win the lottery. Every night. For years and years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Finally, one day God fed, gets fed up, reveals himself and says, man, at least buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> right? You do little things consistently and eventually something will pay off. Yes. 100%. Um, you know, the... the The, the, how do I say this? I think there are two significant, well, maybe more than two, um, but there are significant things that keep us from, from seeing life that way. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, we, we love to overcomplicate things. I mean, I do it myself. Right. Right. All the time. Like I'll get up and I have my to-do list with 93 items and I'm like, oh my God, it's so much stuff. What am I going to do? And I sit there frozen for a little bit. And then I'm like, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose something that's going to take me 10 minutes to do mm -hmm. just to get something off the list. Right. Get that out of there. Now, all of a sudden you go, oh, you feel a little bit good about yourself, right? Oh, I've, I've actually done something. Yeah. Like, yay me let well let me go do another thing right you pick something that'll take half an hour you go do that now you've gotten two things out of the list and you're like oh man i'm on a roll so now you can go okay what's the critical thing that i have to do today right and you sit down and you start doing it all right and all of a sudden that big complexity we build for ourselves starts to dwindle Mm -hmm. Not only that, as we start looking at it, there are a lot of things that are actually unnecessary. Right. Honestly, I, I, I can't live without a to-do list. And on average, I would say 60% of everything I put on my to-do list is useless. Right. Right. As I start whittling down what's important, what matters, mm -hmm. things just start falling off. Right. And, and it's easy to know what doesn't matter because it'll stay on that list for days and days and days and days and days. 
And it's like, you know what? I, I still haven't done this thing. And obviously it doesn't matter because nothing bad's happened, right? <laughs> like, at the time, I thought this was really important, but apparently it's not. There are way more important. So get that out of there, right? Reduce complexity. It's like um, if we think about the first person to invent the wheel, mm -hmm. right? Arguably the greatest invention. But if we think about the wheel, that first person didn't sit down to design a wheel required to withstand the forces of a, a high-speed train. Right. Right. And there's no way they could have. They didn't have the technology back then. They, they didn't have the right metals. They didn't have, you know, all the equipment necessary to manufacture this thing. If, if they had went in going, I'm going to design a wheel for a high-speed train, the wheel would have never been invented. Right. Right. What they had to do was figure out just two things. Mm -hmm. What is the shape of the wheel? And where is the axle? Right. Because those are actually the critical things. It has to be round and the axle has to be in the middle. Right. That's it. That is it. No need to overcomplicate it. So true. Right? Yes. Um, but, but again, we do that all the time. And, and that's something that stops us from moving forward regularly. Yes. Right. It, it goes back to the size of the challenge, which is one of those things that, that dampens our motivation about doing something. Right. Right. There's so much to do. How do I get this done? Well, you don't have to do all of it. And a lot of what you think you have to do, maybe you don't. Yeah. Right, whittle it down to the actually critical parts. Mm -hmm. What's most important? Well, the most important thing for a wheel is to be round and for the axle to be in the middle. Right. So let me go focus on those. So um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, honestly, that, that's really the crux of everything is yeah. You know, if I can put life into two words, mm -hmm. it's okay. It's actually three words. It's exercise and be practical. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. We just, uh, I think we get lost in, in a lot of information, a lot of nebulous concepts. Yeah. Um, you know, again, to, to write a book, maybe you don't need to go on a spiritual journey. Right. Um, you know, maybe you just need to write an outline. It's actually, I'll tell the story so it makes sense because I just realized we talked about this before we started recording. Um, mm -hmm. So I had a client that came to me and she said, you know, I want to write a book. The problem is every time I sit down, I have like this mental handbrake and I can't write. And my first thought was, you know, I know nothing about writing. I'm not an author. I, I don't even particularly like writing. Mm -hmm. Now, what the heck am I going to do here? How am I going to help this person? Right. Writer's block. I know nothing about writer's block. Right. But I said, okay, I will work with, you know, I, I'll use my method. Mm -hmm. of breaking down the problem and, and figuring out what's at the crux of it. And if it doesn't work, I'll give her her money back and, you know, she'll move on with life and so will I and everything will be fine. So I started asking questions. Well, you know, tell me about the book. So she tells me the story of the book and I say, okay, so do you know how the book starts? Yes, I do. Do you know how it ends? Yes, I do. Do you know roughly what's in the middle? Yes, I do. Okay. What happens when you sit down to write? Well, I have great ideas, but they require me to change everything. All right. And at that point, everything became obvious. I said, well, your problem is not that you're having a writer's block. Your problem is that you're writing an infinite number of books because you have a great idea that requires everything to change. Then you have another great idea and that requires everything else to change. And you're mm -hmm. just going in the circle. In other words, these great ideas 
are great ideas for a different book, not this one. Mm-hmm. Right? Write them down, set them aside there for another book. And also sit down and write what are the constants in this book? Right. Right. What's the beginning? What's the middle? What's the end? Who are the main characters? What do they do? Mm-hmm. And if you have a great idea that requires that stuff to change, it's for a different book. And she said, well, in writing, they call that an outline. And I never wanted to make one. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, if you want to write a book, I'm sorry, but you have to write an outline. She said, okay, yeah. I'm going to go write an outline. Um, so yeah, just be, be practical. Think, think about things from a, a practical perspective, if right. you can. Right. Um, you know, it, it's, for some people, it's, easy for some people it's more difficult you know if it's more difficult for you find somebody who's practical right right you can hire a coach or you can talk to a friend engineers are great for practicality if you have any engineering friends go go bug them about stuff right Mm -hmm. how how do i solve this problem whatever it may be an engineer knows nothing about writing a book generally right (laughs) we're we're concerned with other things but go ask an engineer um, or just, you know, anybody who you think is practical. Right. Um, yeah. Life, life is not as complicated as we think it is. Well, I mean, the things that are out of control, out of our control are, are can be very complicated, right? I mean, we're talking about political, social, political, you know, world events, blah, blah. Those things we can't do much about. But we can influence our, our own little, I don't want to call it a bubble, but really that's what it is, right? We all live in our, in our own bubble. That we can influence because we can influence ourselves. Right. And by influencing ourselves, we can influence our circumstances. Yes. Right. Our, our, our happiness at work, our income levels, the, the health of our relationships, you know, how we physically feel, i.e. our physical health, all those things we can influence, you know, and, and we don't need to go on, on these journeys of discovery that, yes, I'm sure some of them are effective, but the reality is, you know, who can afford to go to India Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, work with somebody for three months there. Yeah, very rich people can do that. They can check out of life for three months and, and go to India or Nepal or whatever and discover themselves or whatever it is that they're there for. Okay. Right? But the majority of us can't do that. Sure. I can't afford to go to just, you know, go do whatever I want for three months. Right. Right? Most people can't do that. So be practical. And the, the interesting thing is when you approach things in a practical way and you start getting things done, you start accomplishing things, you start seeing what you're capable of, you actually end up doing the same thing you would on a spiritual journey anyway, because you start figuring out who you are, right? Mm-hmm. You start noticing your strengths, what you're good at, what drives you, what makes you happy. Right. right? And, and it becomes very easy to actually go, Oh, I know exactly who I am, mm-hmm. right? I, I know what I'm good at. I right. know what I'm capable of. I know what I'm worth. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like I said, two things, two things, three words, be practical and exercise. I love it. Now you have a, a program you have. Can you tell us a little about the program and where they can find it? Uh, the program is on my website. My website is superself, one word, superself.me. Um, it's a 10-week program. The, there are three parts to it. One of it, one of them, obviously, I've talked about it, right? It's physical exercise. Mm-hmm. The second part is what in medicine they call cognitive reframing. Mm-hmm. Um, the word for the rest of us is perspective, changing your perspective. Um, right. Perspective is critical. I, I've, you know, 
a lot of shows that I've listened to you, to a viewers, um, the speakers tend to talk about perspective a lot. A lot of people mm -hmm. talk about perspective. I'll right. give you an example. Um, once upon a time when I was an engineer, I had um, imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm not good enough. Everybody around me is so much better. I don't know mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Sooner or later, they're going to figure me out. They're going to get rid of me. Everything is terrible. Everything is horrible, blah, blah, blah. I didn't realize it until years later, but if you apply some cognitive reframing, in other words, if you change your perspective, things become different. Yes. Right. And the key about changing your perspective is to not just pick random things that you wish. Right. right? I can't go to bed every night thinking tomorrow when I wake up, golden coins are going to fall out of my ears. <laughs> right. It, it's just, it's not going to happen. It's unrealistic. Right. So the, the key to cognitive reframing is to base your argument on something real. What do mm -hmm. I mean by that? What's my argument? My argument in my case is that I actually do belong here. Mm -hmm. And what are the facts that I can use to reinforce that notion? Well, in my case, I spent 10 years at the same company. During that time, I got four promotions and tripled my salary, right? So if I was incompetent, if I didn't know what I was doing, mm -hmm. none of that would have happened, right? right? As they say, you can fool some of the people some of the time, but not all the people all the time. Right. So when I had this imposter syndrome, if I had known these things at the time, mm -hmm. the way I would have dealt with it is just anytime I feel that way, remind myself, hold on. I actually have a long body of work that shows I belong here. I, I've worked on important projects. Mm -hmm. I've led development teams, right? I, I've been in meetings with CTO and CEO and, you know, major players in the company. And, and here I am after all these years, I'm still here. Obviously, I'm providing value. And if you regularly do that, you start reprogramming yourself into the reality of the situation rather than the, the gaslighting that for whatever reason you've done to yourself. I, I can't tell you why I had that imposter syndrome, but obviously I had gaslit myself into thinking I'm not good enough. I don't belong here. They're going to figure me out. Oh my God, everything is a disaster. I'm going to get fired. The world is going to fall apart. Right. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't the reality. So my life would have been a lot easier if I had known these things or if I had known these methods of changing right. who I think. Because then I could have gotten to work every morning going, yeah, I belong here. People value me. And today, like yesterday and the day before and the years before, I'm going to do cool stuff that right. people are going to be happy with. Right? It's a very different way to live. Yeah. And, and it affects everything you do. So that's cognitive reframing. Um, that's the second part of my program. Um, that's a very personal thing because we're all very unique, mm -hmm. right? So it really depends on the specific person, what we talk about and, and how we start looking at things. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the third part is just, well, I say just, um, it's not just, it's critically important. Mm -hmm. um, I'm saying just as in, this is a common thing that coaches and therapists work with is what are your individual challenges, right? right? If, if you come to me and you say, you know what? I am terrible at time management. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to focus on that. Right. Right. If you tell me, um, I'm terrible with self-accountability. I need someone to help. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, first of all, we're going to start working on how to actually become more self-accountable. But at the same time, I'm going to help you by keeping you accountable. Because if you need me to text you every single day to get you to go on that 20-minute walk, I'll do it. Right. Right. If you need me to text you Tuesday morning because you have something important coming up and you got to get this, that, and the other done, 
I will text you, right? If, if I'm not um, in a meeting with a client, I'll call you. Hey, you got this coming up today, right? And here's what you got to do. And, and if you do this, mm -hmm. everything is going to go fine. Right. So the, there are some um, constants in the program, meaning the physical exercise. Mm -hmm. There are some halfway constants, which is, you know, the cognitive reframing, because it's always there, but it's dependent on, on the specific individual situation. Right. And then there's a third part, which is truly individual. It, it's, yeah. you know, what what are what are that person's challenges? Um, so yeah, that's that's in essence what it is. Um, the reason it's ten weeks is first of all, you got to spend at least a month with the physical exercise to see the benefits, mm -hmm. right? Um, as you know, I, I don't know how well known this is, but I, I think it tends to be, you know, general knowledge. It takes about a month to form a habit. Mm -hmm. And because we're generally looking at m forming multiple healthy habits, mm -hmm. 10 weeks seems to be a good spot. Um, I know a lot of coaches will, will do much longer programs like year long and all that. I, I will work with clients after the program if, if they want, but I don't, I don't force them to do that because I, I, I think two and a half months is a good spot where people start understanding the benefits of, again, being consistent, right? Doing little things every day. Right. And, you know. I don't need you to be dependent on me for the rest of your life, right? right. My, my goal is to teach you these important lessons so then you can take them and apply them to your life on your own. Mm -hmm. But again, everybody's different. And, and, and some people's challenges are pretty large. And we're all individuals. Some of us need less time. Some of us need more. So if, you know, if there's more required after the initial 10 weeks, then that's fine but I don't require it, right. but I do, re I do require the 10 weeks. Right. Because if, I mean, if we have one or two meetings, yeah, at the end, you're going to feel good and you're going to be like, heck yeah. Mm -hmm. And then nothing's really going to change. Ultimately. Right. Right. It, it's like going to a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. you, you go to a motivational speaker for an hour, they get you fired up. They tell you some amazing stories and, how everything is possible and how you can do this and you're the best and da, 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 da. and then you walk out of there you're fired up for a few days and then what happens well you just go back to your standard life and that's mm -hmm. that All right. right um so yeah that that's why it's a program rather than one offs i will do one offs from time to time but they're they're they tend to be special cases Mm -hmm. um, yeah that, that's how it works and um I, I i don't know what else to tell you it's uh you know we have to get into specific personal things for for me to to get into too much more you know right well this has been amazing you know and i you know i'd love to have you back on the show you know yeah that'd be we great Remind everybody about your website, where they can contact you. Superself.me. Super self me. It's that simple. <laughs> Super self me. And you're also available on the social networks, I assume. You're on all the social networks. I have an account on Facebook that I haven't done much with. <laughs> I, I have an account on LinkedIn. Obviously, I have plenty of followers, but I haven't actually posted anything. Um, I just started... A LinkedIn account. Okay. So the, the whole social network thing, uh, I got to tell you, I'm, you know, I'm not an influencer. I'm not a making videos kind of guy. Um, because again, I, I like to work directly with people. The best thing to do is uh, just to contact you right directly to you from your, from just, your web. 
go directly to my website. I did decide recently that as I have time, I'll make little videos and post them on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so inevitably there will be content there, mm -hmm. um, but I don't have any yet. Okay. Uh, again, I, I really enjoy working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. Um, if I'm just sitting in front of the camera, blah, 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 like I, I don't know what people need, what they want, what their you know, current struggle is. So how can I possibly help them in a way? Right. I realize that's not completely true, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because maybe I'll put something out there and somebody will hear it and go, oh, that's what I needed. Right. Right. So for that reason, I've decided that, um, again, as I have time, I'll, I'll start making little videos and putting them on, on Instagram. Yeah. Um, but, you know, th this is one of those things, I didn't mention this so far, but one of the important things about how do we better our circumstances is knowing what we're good at. Yes. Right. Because if, you know, I'll go back to you being a sea captain. If it's not something you're interested in or particularly good at, I mean, how effective of a sea captain are you going to be? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, if I want to be a rock star, well, you know, I have no musical talent. I love music. Music is always playing. I have a, you know, very wide encompassing um, music taste. I listen to everything. But I have no musical talent. Right. Right. It's not my strength. So right. why would I, you know, dedicate time and energy to something at which I will inevitably fail? Right. Right. Well, the, the, there's, there's nothing good about, um, let me, I was going to say something and I'm going to rephrase it. I was going to say there's nothing good about failure. There's a lot of good about failure in terms of learning. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing good in failing just for the sake of failing. Right. Right. And, and if I were to decide to be a rock star, I would fail just for no reason. So, you know, something for everybody to think about. Right. Um, you know, I've talked to people who, who will come to me and say, well, you know, I, I had this job and I'm really unhappy and I don't think I was very good at it and yada, yada, yada. And the key is, I don't think I was very good at it. And I'm looking at that person going, well, you have not just a bachelor's degree, but a master's degree. Yes. You're obviously very good at problem solving, right? And, and I start listing off all, all their accomplishments and all the things they're good at. Mm -hmm. And you tell me that you weren't good at this. So right. let me ask you a question. Were you interested in this? And they go, no. I said, well, that's why you're not good at it. Right. Right. How can you possibly be good at something you're not interested in? Right. It has to come from the heart. Exactly. Um, something very, very important to keep in mind. Don't, don't try to be amazing at something you're just not good at. So exactly. again, you know, social media for me is one of those things where just yapping in front of a camera, it's like, wow, well, I don't know what people want to hear. Right. But, but. Um, I have decided to put little videos. They, they will be on Instagram at some point. Um, Great. So yeah, there is that. But just go to my website. You know, like any website, contact information is all over the place. You can, you know, actually schedule um, a consultation with me directly through there. Um, yeah. All right. Excellent. Alex, this has been wonderful. I, I really enjoyed your conversation. You were so thorough. You gave such great advice and you really provided our audience with a ton of information and, and the way you actually exhibited it was wonderful. You were really, from start to finish, you really covered in detail all areas that needed to be covered. As you can see, I didn't ask you a lot of questions because you you basically covered everything. You, you took my job <laughs> So, you know, but you, you did a wonderful job and you Thank provided you. Audience with a lot of great information and, and it's all about, you know, it's all about being practical and not complicating things. And today you really showed the audience how to do that. And I, I want to thank you for coming on the show and, you know, providing us with such great information. And I, you know, I hope you'll be on the show again in the future. I'd love to have you back. And I just want to thank you once again for, for being on the show. Thank you so much, Stacey. I really appreciate it. Very nice talking to you. It's been very nice talking to you and you have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.
拜拜。